Hi there my friends, welcome to my YouTube channel. Hope everyone's keeping well. Well it's finally happened, everybody's been asking for it. Longer videos, so this one is running at just under two hours. So grab yourself um, a drink or get your sketchbook out or get some painting materials out and just chill out with me for one hour and 55 minutes. Okay, we're working on pastel matte paper we're using soft pastels and pastel pencils today and we're creating a Lynx and you can see the finished painting top left hand side so you can see where I'm aiming. I don't go into depth in this video with the background I just show basic application at the beginning and then we're straight into working on the Lynx. If a background is something that you'd like to see in more depth then once you've sit, watched this video head over to polar bear and pastel and that video shows a nice in-depth um, portion of working on a more detailed background and how I go applying all the layers and things like this. In short what I did with the background on this one I went in with soft pastels first as you saw at the beginning of the video and then once I've got a nice base coat of differing tone, tonal values of greens from quite a dark green, mid green and a light green, I then went on and used one of these soft tools that you can see me using now and just popped it into the white pan pastel and then did some vertical lines uh, just to create a feeling of out of focus trees in the background. It's quite simple to do. Um, just wanted to keep everything out of focus in the background so that the main focus and detailing would be on the links itself. So if you're new to pastels, um, I definitely recommend Clairefontaine pastel matte paper. I don't use any other pastel paper now. This is the one I always use and that I always recommend to people. It does everything a pastel paper should do. It has the texture of cork, which is quite unusual. And it, to touch, it doesn't feel like it's got a lot of tooth. But when you start using it, it, got, it has tons of tooth. And I've never been able to run out of, well, I've not tried, but I've never run out of the ability to lay pastel down. It holds it so well that no fixative is required. As soon as a painting's finished, it's mounted, framed, and then sent off to the buyer, or if it's commissioned, sent off to um, whoever's um, ordered the commission, or it hangs on my wall, or it goes into an exhibition and things like that. And not once have I had any pastel fall off once a painting is finished, mounted, and framed. So that's Clairefontaine pastel matte paper. The pastel that you saw me applying right at the beginning, and actually it's the pastel I'm applying now, is called Pan Pastel. They come in little round tubs, like a makeup compact tub. You can buy the colours singularly, or you can buy the colours in sets. They do a starter set, landscape set, portrait set. If you can afford it, I suggest you get the starter set of 20 pans. And then they're open stock, um, so you, you can buy singular colours if you want to. And you just simply build up your collection as you go, the colours that you think you're going to need. Or if you don't know if you're going to like them, <clears throat> because they're, they're open stock, pick up a colour, couple of colours that you think you're going to like and give them a try. <clears throat> Excuse me, but if you're anything like me, you're going to be smitten from the word go. So just blend in the pastel into the tooth of the paper with that um, paper stick. I can't remember what they're called, sorry. They begin with T, but I can't remember the name. Now these tools that you can see me using are also by Pan Pastel and they're called soft tools, S-O-F-F-T tools. And they come in a variety of shapes. Uh, I think there's four in the set. And then they have little foam socks that you pop on, um, corresponding shapes, and you can apply the pasta with that too. Okay, onto the links. So, eyes. For me, uh, an animal portrait, I always start with the eyes. Because for me, the eyes are the most important part, because it really it's the, the part of a portrait that people look to straight away. I think that's quite natural. If you're a beginner, 
I suggest, or if you're working with a new medium maybe, I do suggest that you work both eyes at the same time. So the base colour goes on to one eye and then that same base colour but base coat colour goes on to the other eye and you work both eyes the same. The reason being is there's nothing worse than finishing painting one eye and then going to start painting the other eye and forget the process. So if you're new or unfamiliar with the uh, medium you're working with, work both eyes at the same time. But here, because it's techniques and things that I've done for years and years and years I create this eye and film it and then I switch the uh, video camera off and create the other eye okay so when I go to create eyes especially big cat eyes they're wonderful if you work if you want to practice painting or drawing eyes big cat eyes are wonderful because they normally have nice bright colors in them and it's the brightest color that I choose first so whether it's um, a light a light bright yellow as in this case or a light bright blue that takes some saying or a light bright green I go in with that color first then the next color I use so it's bright yellow then orange and I'm just obviously delving into my pencil stash at the minute and back with a brighter yellow even even brighter than the first bright color that I put down pastels are semi-transparent so the color that you're of paper you're working on will affect the look of the pastels so because this is classed as a light gray paper that may dull the effect of really bright colors until you get a few more layers on so working so i've done the light bright yellow then i've put an orange on and blended the two together with the rolled up paper stick that i can't remember the name of now I'm going in, this is sort of a burgundy colour, so I'm going in there and just outlining the bottom edge of the eye, just so I don't lose those guidelines. Then a, a reddish brown going in, and the idea is to create that dome-like effect that we see on an eye. We know we know eyes are um, round, don't we? We know they're shaped like a, you know, a snooker ball or a football, and we want to recreate that on a flat piece of paper that's the whole idea and then it becomes like an optical illusion I guess you you know you think you're seeing something that actually isn't there so there will, there will be no texture as in physical texture but we want visual texture that's what we're looking for to make eyes look more interesting so by putting darker colors around the edges of the eye it starts to make the eye look like it's doming off the paper hopefully so carrying on, so I've put a shadow line around the bottom of the eye and now we're just building up the darks around the edges of the eye and we'll be blending those into the lighter areas just to create a feeling of a domed effect. Um, at this point the uh, reference images have been put to one side because eyes, if you want to get really really particular and lots of detail into an eye you need to be creating it quite a bit bigger than this so because I'm limited on space I just want the eyes to look how I want the eyes to look when you're working from a photograph that photograph is just a guideline really <clears throat> it's just something for you to refer to uh, as in the word reference you want to make the painting your own um, I get sort of maybe three quarters of a way through a painting and then I put the reference image away. We're not trying to recreate a photograph. It's, uh, this is my interpretation of a photograph. Um, I already have the photograph, so, well, I already have the photograph that's been taken by a friend, Emmanuel Keller. Um, I don't need another photograph. I need my, or I want my interpretation of that photograph. I hope that makes sense. So I've gone round, right round the bottom edge with the dark colours um, and now I'm adding other tones and it's just backwards and forwards, just trying to get a nice balance, trying to get the colour to look how I want it to look and the form to look how I want to look. As you can see, I'm saving the pupil for last. I don't go in with the pupil first. Now we've put quite a bit of yellow down and eventually we're going to put some black down but I don't want the black 
right next to yellow because if the two mix you get this awful dirty green colour um, if you've worked with acrylics or watercolours you might may have experienced it where blacks touched yellow and you've ended up with a oh, it's a really weird colour it's just like this yeah muddy green it's uh, not nice so that's another reason why the oranges and this reddish brown is being put down before any black goes down at all it's just protecting the yellow areas from when the black goes down okay so some more highlights backwards and forwards I do fiddle quite a bit with uh, colors but one thing I can suggest is people ask me um, what colors do you use and really it's anything that's at hand and I do go through an awful lot of colors in one portrait because if what well, I pick up one and I try it and I don't like it I put it back down and I'll pick up another one color isn't the be all and end all I'm looking for contrast in this eye the contrast is the difference between the lightest of the lights and the darkest of the darks and it's the contrast in the end that will make this eye pop okay so I've gone round the pupil with a little bit of dark as well and just add in this nice reddish colour sort of a muted red I think the pencils I used throughout this project were Derwent and Creta Colour but I'll obviously list everything in the description now we're going in with black black's going in and I'm not going to let the black go anywhere near where there's yellow So just defining those edges around the eye turning the pencil as I work and the reason I'm turning the pencil in my hand as I work is just to catch a sharper edge just so that I'm not having to continually sharpen my pencils um, to keep a fine point just keep turning the pencil in your hand and the paper itself actually sharpens the, the point of the pencil to a certain extent when I do want to physically sharpen a pastel pencil I take the wood surround off with a knife um, there is a video on my YouTube channel how I do that it's not just a case of grabbing a knife and just slicing off pieces of wood there is a knack to it to stop the pastel itself from breaking so if you want to check that out uh, please feel free to do so later um, but yeah, so if I do come to the part, the point where I do need to sharpen a pastel pencil, it's just a case of taking some of the wood off with a with a knife, sanding the pastel pigment itself on a piece of fine sandpaper. So when you see me use the rolled up piece of paper, I'm literally just pushing pigment into the paper and just doing a little bit of blending between the colours, that's all. So I've been on with white, now I'm going on with a grey, a light grey. Just altering the tones and just um, altering little bits of detail and things. Just until I get the eye looking how I want it to look. And I can spend ages on eyes. It's um, <clears throat> probably the most time consuming part of a portrait, I would say, is just getting the eyes right. The eye looks a bit... Um, misshaped I guess but that's the angle I've got the camera uh, going in at because I do get quite up close and personal when I'm working on the eyes so I had to have the camera offset slightly I work upright at the easel with pastels so no way was I going to get an overhead shot uh, I know a lot of pastel artists work with their project flat on a table with an overhead camera but I don't work like that I work um, at an easel I work um, at a, on a table if I'm working watercolours but nearly all of the mediums are worked upright at an easel. So just defining the outer edge and I know that the eyelashes and the eyelid are going to create a slight shadow across the top of the eye so that will be going in as well. It's just thinking about things like that um, the shadowing part at the top isn't actually in the reference photo but uh, to you know when you see a photo you know that that photo is real and that's how things actually look 
but when you're creating a painting what might look correct in a photograph doesn't always look correct in a painting so you need to keep that in mind as well. So really being careful with using black. Less is more when it comes to black and white, definitely. You can overdo the black and you can definitely overdo the use of white and if you use too much it loses its um, wow factor. So softening out the blackened areas with a touch of blue, that's a Derwent pencil. The Derwent are very soft and the Creta colour pencils are a little bit harder. So whenever you see a burgundy barrel on a pencil, you know that's a Derwent one. So a little bit of burgundy gone in and now a little bit of black. And feathering the edges of the pupil very, very slightly to make them look more realistic. Then with a bit more black, feathering out into the orange that um, remember we put orange around the pupil, a little bit of blue, a little bit of reflective blue because as you can see in the finished painting the uh, sky above the links is a very pale blue, uh, powder blue and a little bit of white going in but not a harsh white. If you see a photograph where there's a pinpoint of white in the eye it simply means that the photo's been taken with a flash. You see less of that nowadays. Nowadays, I sound, yeah, well, 57. So <laughs> but I remember the days when every photograph, you know, taken in low light levels, the flash would go off from whatever camera you were using and your subject would end up with this just pinpoint of white. And all that denotes nowadays is that it was taken with a flash, as was then. Okay, so... We've got some more yellow in, so backwards and forwards, it's a long process. Um, putting a little bit more red in, just playing with the colours. And it's just about having fun. I think if you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. You know, it's just, it, art should be enjoyable, it should be a stress-free time. It can be a little bit stressful, I guess, if you work in commissions to a deadline or gallery work to a deadline, things like that can be a little bit stressful, but you've still got to enjoy the process. Softening edges. When you're working with pastel pencils, <clears throat> well any pencils really, uh, coloured pencils and things like that, be sure, if you've got a large selection of pencils, be sure to keep the ones out that you're actually working with. Don't slot them back in with the others because the tendency can be to then pick up the wrong colour. <coughs> Excuse me, speaking of wrong colours, if by any chance when you're working on a painting that you do apply the wrong colour in a certain area, don't panic. If you can cover it up, that's fair enough, or if you can wipe it off, i.e. if you're painting, you can wipe it off, then fine. But if you've applied a wrong colour and it's permanent, the best thing to do is apply that wrong colour in other places of your painting too. Then it will look deliberate and it won't look like a mistake. Just uh, something to keep in mind. Pop that in your memory bank. <laughs> so feeling as though this eye is uh, coming to completion, I'll start moving out and out onto the eyelids, just darkening certain areas. Wow, this is a long video. Okay, so we're nearly 20 minutes in, folks. If you want to pause and get another drink, by all means, do. So applying burgundy now to the area of skin that is at the bottom of the eye. And predominantly, I am working dark to light during this project. You can work light to dark, uh, but you, obviously you can also work dark to light. 
and I'll go between the two depending on what area of the project I'm working on. So we've got both eyes in now. <coughs> oh, you have to excuse me, I've got a um, frog in my throat. So starting applying some base coats now. So I could go in and apply all these base coats with the pan pastels as I did the background. But I preferred to put down a lighter layer. And the reason being I wanted plenty of tooth um, because there's a lot of detailing to go on to these areas. Now we're working on the links itself. And I wanted the, lots of fur texture. So I knew I was going to be building up lots and lots of layers. And I know that the uh, final layers, oh yes, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. I forgot I'd added my little... Um, yeah, my little zebra, like and subscribe to the video. Yeah, please and like and subscribe if you haven't already. Okay, so carrying on. I knew that the um, the layers, the, the detailing layers, especially the final detailing layers, were going to be of lighter colours. And I was going to be doing some glazing of the lighter colours too. So I didn't want any um, base coat layers that were too dark. Because as I said earlier in the video, pastels are they might look really opaque you know when you see them in packs um, whether it's soft pastels or pastel pencils they look opaque but when you start to apply them you actually see that they're semi-opaque you know you can see the paper color through some of them depending on the color that you're using so just with that in mind and I wanted to make sure that the creams and whites um that I was going to apply late in later layers for the detailing were going to be able to sit okay over the base coat layers and that the base coat layers weren't going to dilute the effect of the lighter colors I guess you could say. So that isn't white that's uh, going on it's a pale olive it's sort of a green color and you think mm, green why would you add green to to a painting of a lynx but it, when it mixes with the grey of the paper it actually doesn't look um, green it's quite strange it's quite a nice colour to use in animal portraiture that's olive green by Derwent so I'm just experimenting this is the first part of the fur I'm working on and I'm just experimenting with a few different colours. Some of those colours I'll carry on using throughout the rest of the project and some I won't. And if it's a colour that I won't use again, I just pop it back in with all of the other pastel pencils that I haven't picked up yet. But obviously the ones that I am picking up and using and deciding to keep throughout the project, I keep in a little tray to one side of me. So going in with this um, blending tool again, just blending and pushing the pigment down into the tooth of the paper. <coughs> now when, when you sit, look at a photograph and you see something white, white fur or white feathers, nothing is just pure white. Very rarely, um, unless a photo, photograph's been you know, blown out and the contrast has been um, hiked up, nothing is just pure white. Um, white's reflective so it'll reflect colours surrounding it and obviously where hairs overlap or feathers overlap they'll be shadowing too and obviously the shadowing won't be white. Um, to make shadowing in white look more realistic you can use blues, um, lilacs and that'll make the white look colder, cold shadows or you can use beiges um, and darker earth tones to make the shadows look warm. So I went with the warm slant on this. If I'd have had a snowy background, maybe I would have used blues and lilacs for the shadows in the white, but I stuck with nice um, muted earth tones for shadows. So the base coat's running down the left-hand side of the cat's muzzle. Um, I started applying these beiges and earth tones very lightly, light layers, so that when I go over them with whites and creams to create uh, more fur detail, the shadows would look warm. I hope that makes sense. So applying darks and medium tones 
over the lighter base coats and I'm not putting any pressure on these pencils at all if you want to apply less pressure to a pencil hold the pencil further back along the barrel you only really need to hold it like in a writing instrument when you're going in for really fine detail so I've turned the board round now those of you that have known me for a long time know or will probably remember that I did have a lot of problems with um, rotator cuff muscles in my shoulder so I do rotate the board quite a bit just to make it more comfortable for me and because I never ever want sh <laughs> shoulder problems again now that thankfully they've gone. So applying um, a pink, that's a really light pink and now applying white and it's, it's just to give it that little bit of interest if I was to, and that's a very light yellow. So light pink, light yellow, white, mixing them together add a bit of interest a bit of depth now as you can see as I'm adding the white hairs over this darker background you instantly see it starting to look like fur and you can go backwards and forwards with this so blending that's um, I'm just blending with the white with the color that's underneath and that's tinting the white some of the techniques you can do on all pastel paper, papers some techniques you can only do on pastel papers that have got a lot of tooth like this Clairefontaine pastel paper so just be warned that um, you know processes do vary well the process doesn't vary but the outcome definitely does with the type of paper you're using so going down and just skipping over the edge onto the background. I always put background in first when I'm working portraiture. I want the subject to be sitting on top of the background. That's why I do the background first. I think the worst thing that I see in um, students' artwork is when they do a subject and then decide to put a background in and there's then they end up with like a halo around the subject because they've not been able to butt the background up to the um, project itself, the subject itself, sorry. So I always do backgrounds first and then the subject sitting on top. Blend the two together. So you can do this two ways. You can put down white hair strokes to begin with and then glaze colour over the top. Out which tints the the white or you can put a color down to begin with put the white on top and then gently blend and it's glazing that white but with the color that's already underneath it and during this project I go backwards and forwards between the two techniques there's no reason why I could I could just work with one of the techniques but during this project I just seem to be in a little world of my own and I end up using both uh, techniques feathering out again some of the lighter hair and I really do go backwards and forwards and the more of the painting I work through the more I flit about from one area to it to the other as I'm creating a painting I'm constantly looking for color correction and creating a sense of balance throughout the the painting so going on darker because obviously when you blend colours they merge together and if you've got a lot of white pigment they, they become a lot lighter and sometimes you have to go back in and add darks again but that's fine. Backwards and forwards, light to dark, dark to light working um, on your project is fine in pastel as long as you're working with quality products and you're using quality paper. So over to an ear let's see how we get an ear to look like an ear and these lynx ears are lovely aren't they with a tuft of fur sticking out the tops they're brilliant absolutely brilliant okay so as we did before on the um, face of the lynx we're just starting off applying some base coats rough and ready we're just getting pigment on that paper we're not putting in any detail at this point we're just getting colour onto the paper so that it can be blended in and give us something to work on top of 
So if you're unsure about what colours to use on a base coat layer, if you get your reference image and squint, you might get a few looks from people who are sitting with you, but squint at your reference image and the colour you see when you're squinting, because you know by squinting we, we get rid of all detail, don't we, when we're looking at something and we purposefully squint. Um, the colour that you see when you're squinting uh, is roughly the colour that you use for base coats on certain areas. You can do that or you, if you've got um, ref, ref, uh, photo editing app on your phone, just uh, make your photograph blurry, so take it out of focus. And you can darken it slightly and then the resulting colours in certain areas are the colours you use for your base coats. It's really, really simple and it takes the guesswork out of it and as you become more proficient and more experienced you can just look at a photograph um, you won't have to blur it out or squint or darken it or anything like that and you'll start to notice which base coats you actually need so practice makes progress not perfection if we were to reach the point of perfection There'd be no more challenges ahead, there'd be no more learning, and it'd be boring. So, yeah. And knowing that practice makes progress uh, means there's no such thing as wasted time if you're drawing or painting, because even if it doesn't go how you want it to go, you're still constantly learning. Okay. Going in with some darks now. And all paintings go through a stage that as artists call an ugly stage and when you, when you do work like this and look back at it you know I can't remember doing this I do that many paintings that it comes becomes a bit of a blur but when I watch it back and you think wow that really did go through an ugly stage uh, it's quite comical really but you just trust the process trust the techniques and um, yeah just plow on through and the best thing is, is to break your painting down. So break it down into smaller areas. If I were to do this t um, technique of applying the base coats all over the links in one go, oh my word, I, I think that would be really overpowering. Um, just to take, you know, looking at a large painting in the ugly stage with everything looking in the ugly stage. But if you break it down, do the eyes, um, then do, you know, part of the face or one of the ears and bring it to near completion you can actually keep looking back at that part of your painting and think I can do this I can take it through the ugly stage to a more completed um, version of itself and it just gives you a bit of a boost if you are off put by the ugly stage of painting and it's just about layering you just keep keep on layering Keep on layering until it looks like you want it to look. If at any point, if you're using um, a less than pastel paper, so a pastel paper that doesn't have the layering capabilities of ones like Clairefontaine Pastel Mat, then get yourself a can of fixative. So the two that I can recommend are Windsor and Newton Pastel Fixative. Um, Luxley pastel fixative. I've used both of those um, on projects where I'm working pastel on different kinds of paper and you can just spray between layers or do an initial spray on a normal piece of paper and it gives you a bit of tooth. If this isn't to hand but you do have some white gouache then you can get a piece of paper like watercolour paper Coat it with a layer of white gouache, let it dry or dry it off with a hair dryer either way and then work on that with pastel. You will be able to layer up a few layers. It will never be the same as working on Clairefontaine pastel matte paper. Now I'm not sponsored by them. I'm not getting paid to uh, mention their product. I just think it is perfect for pastel. I've used other mediums on it as well. It will take mixed media, so it will take um, water-based products and acrylics and inks and 
graphite, charcoal, obviously pastel. It will take a multitude of products, but it really does shine and come into its own when using pastels, soft pastels and pastel pencils. It's what it was made for and it's uh, phenomenal. It's acid free, so um, archival properties exist. Um, it's just perfect, it really is. And it's worth spending that little bit more. Art materials, as we know, in 2023 are not cheap. Everything's increased in price um, due to everything that's going on in the world. I'm not going to start getting into politics and things like that. And I know that for some people, you know, paper is expensive. It's expensive for me. So but the thing is, when you're spending hours sometimes days could be even weeks on projects and you've paid out for your paints or your pencils or your pastels and none of those are cheap either it's such a shame when you see people I don't want to say cheap out but yeah cheap out on paper you know the paper is the can be the be all and end all of a painting because if you're using say paints on a cheap canvas and you've done this amazing painting and then the paint starts to peel off the canvas and it has nothing to do with the paint but it's actually um, the canvas itself and how that was prepared because you bought a cheap pre-gessoed canvas it's such a shame if you work say you've you're working on a pastel painting and you're working on some pastel paper that has a medium amount of tooth <coughs> and you've applied say three or four layers and your painting is going superbly it's coming along you can see where it's heading and then oh no I can't add any more pastel I've run out of tooth oh well there's not a lot you can do about that you can spray some fixative on and hope that that will give you enough tooth for another layer but then you might have to spray again for another layer and again for another layer. And before you know it, you've used up a can of um, fixative spray. I just want my materials to work for me and to do what they're supposed to do. And if that means spending a few pounds more on my paper, I'll do it. I don't want to get frustrated with my art materials. I don't want to get frustrated with the amount of time I might have to put into juggling my art material to try and get it to do what I want it to do and what it should be doing. So for me, I pay a little bit more. I know I've got good quality paper to go with my good quality products and now I can sit back and relax and enjoy creating art. Okay, so moving back to the project. Applying these lovely tufts of fur and when you look at the reference image it just looks like this big black mass of tuft on top of his ear. We know, well I know looking at that photograph that is how he looked in the photograph but to represent that in a painting I think would look false. So I'm going in quite delicate with these tufts. The light will be hitting them. Um, they're black but they'll still be reflecting light sources around them and I just wanted them to look softer and I think it works it, it works in the finished painting if it had gone on too heavy it probably would have looked a bit comical so going back into the ear um, with some darks I think that ear's looking quite nice now happy with it how it's coming along a few lights around the top and done and I have done the other ear so again as I said working with the eyes if you're new to a medium or you're a beginner work the eyes up together the ears you could work up together but you're getting a feel of the process you're getting a feel of your materials if you're trying a new technique try it on a piece of paper to one side so when you're um, working on a subject whatever paper you're working on <coughs> excuse me it's always nice to have a scrap piece of that paper to one side that way you can try out colors you can try out techniques anything like that before 
applying them to your actual project just so that you don't go in blind. So back to the project work in base coats again with pastel pencils as I did in the facial area. I'm just darkening the tones now across this part of the lynx's head and making the fur look a little bit denser. So when working on animal subjects it's always good to get a good reference image, look at the direction the fur is growing because it doesn't just grow in one direction, it alters quite a lot as you work around the face and body contours of uh, animals and it's just nice to portray that like for like plus hair length changes across the subject as well so where the nose is um, as you go up the muzzle towards the eyes the hair is very very short getting towards the forehead and the eyebrow areas the hair gets longer and directions begin to change about how the hair is laying. <coughs> the top of the head we're only going to be able to see the tips of the hair because the hair in front of them um, is covering our view so just bear in mind when you're looking at a reference image just if you know you can make a little note on a piece of paper if you want to which direction hairs are going and how they change length and things like that. So the video itself is very self-explanatory and, and I'm losing my voice. <gasps> I'm just going to have a drink. I'm back. Building up layers. <clears throat> I use this, um, it's like a yellow ochre derwent colour. I use that quite a lot throughout the uh, project. And burgundy. Just creating the texture in that base coat layer. And obviously when you go through, so you can create, a. am not putting detail in, I think there's a the definite difference there between detail and texture. So the texture I want in the base coat layers, um, and I just, it's, I just use the pastels quite randomly, use a lot of different colours, then blend them down with the pencil, with the, um, sorry, paper stump, that I still can't remember the name of and then I, once they're blended down the all the different colours I've used don't blend all together and become just one colour you still end up with a lot of different tones and values in that base coat so that when you go on top with your detailing layers all that sh does show through to a certain extent and it just gives you that added depth and that's what you're looking for. This, the first, you know, it's dense. It's not like, um, let's have a think. Think of a Labrador, a smooth coated Labrador, where the hair is laying um, quite flat to the body, the, the contours of the body. But whereas with a lynx, the hair is a lot denser. And to get that feel of um, depth within a painting, you do need to be layering quite a bit with your base coat layer and with your detailing layers on top. <coughs> Going on with a cream, uh, a creamy yellow colour. It's the yellow colour that we used um, on the face of the the cheek portion of the lynx. So yeah, it's not cream, it, it, it's a light yellow. I used the light yellow, the light pink and the white throughout this project and they, the three of those are by the uh, Creta Colour and you can buy those open stock or you can buy them in sets as with Derwent, Derwent is uh, you can buy the colours open stock or you can buy those in sets and I have a code and I will pop it in the description below let me make a note of that Derwent code 
Um, let's have a look. And if you use the Derwent code on their website um, for the remainder of this year, so it runs out December, uh, last day in December, you can get 25% off any product um, at Derwent. And that's kindly being being kindly gifted to me to give to you all. So, um, yeah, that's a Derwent code that will get you 25% discount on their website for the remainder of this year. Um, last August, August 22, I was invited by Derwent to become a Derwent ambassador. And uh, I gladly took that offer up. And this is one of the things they've sent to me to offer to you. So thank you, Derwent. And moving back to the project. Building up the layers. It's as I said, it's very self explanatory. If you have any questions, please um, drop them in the comments below. If you'd like to see me work on a particular subject or in a particular medium or both, then please drop that um, in the comments as well. I'm making a, a list, a to do list of um, all the ones people have asked me to do. And then I will be ticking them off as I'm doing them. This was at, this project was actually created for a workshop, a pastel workshop I ran yesterday, and the participants participants did remarkably well. I'm so proud of them. All ladies this time, which was nice. We we normally get a mixture of men and women. Um, it was all ladies this time, and it was lovely. There was a lovely uh, camaraderie by the end of the day. It was very nice, very enjoyable workshop proud of them all. I'm not sure how long this painting took to uh, create because generally I'm working on more than one project at a time so I don't sit for eight hours a day and just plod away at one painting. It would uh, I think that'd be a little bit too much for me. So I do um, go between projects and the painting will go on and off the easel over the course of maybe two to three months, I guess. Sometimes less, sometimes more, depends on the size and style and how busy I am and things like that. Okay, so this is nice and close up so you can actually see some bait. Oh, and... <laughs> Playing around with my camera there, okay. So going in with base coats now, working on this part of the forehead. And as you can see, the top of the head, the, um, the uh, where I've um, put some detailing, they're literally just little ticks of colour because how the fur is going back over the head or standing, no, it'll still be standing up but further away and it's going to be the view of the hairs right at the back are going to be obscured by the hairs in front of them so you will literally just see the tips of the hairs so they were created just with ticks of colour, little flicks of colour but now you can actually see the fur being formed with the base coats going on and bringing out some markings <clears throat> and I didn't copy the markings like for like from the reference image it would be too monotonous as long as the fur is going in the right direction and and I could place the markings in um, that would be correct for the species but um, probably not correct for the actual individual I don't need this lynx to be able to identify itself <laughs> via a painting so you know if you're doing if you are doing a commission though of somebody's pet um, or someone's commissioned you to do um, an animal portrait from their photograph of whatever. Maybe they've been on safari and they've photographed a, a lion and they want you to recreate that in a painting. You do need to be marking specific then, obviously because people know their pets and people will know 
um, the you know the photographs that you've used um, for commission based project so you do need to be really specific then but when you're doing something like this where it's um, you know a painting of a lynx that's all I wanted to create is a pastel painting of a lynx I don't need to be marking specific then I just need to be true to the species I mean I couldn't put tiger stripes all over this lynx no it wouldn't look right so you do need to keep the species in mind but that's all and as long as the fur is going in the right direction and it's of the right length the right hair length for the part of the project you're working on uh, then you can you know you can be a little bit more relaxed with the where the markings go as long as they're correct to the species so lots of texture going in <clears throat> place again placing colors in quite randomly um, just to give it that added depth and interest it just adds interest if you're random with your color going in it just adds more interest it's it's the I think it's the diversity of color in the base coats that gives it more interest too uh, stops it the uh, finished project from looking flat going in with some darks uh, don't go in with blacks um, either might go in with a little bit of black right at the end just to put a little bit of shadow into the dark markings but apart from that I didn't use black in the fur that I can remember anyway you watch it the video will prove me wrong but I can't recollect using black in the fur just building up those layers slowly but surely working with the same colors now I'm not deviating away now from I'm not bringing in any new colors now um, now that I've done the left hand side of the face I'm happy with my color choice now uh, no I don't need to bring any more into the mix you can work with too many colors um, I think especially uh, beginners when they buy maybe a set of 120 colouring pencils or 120 pastel pencils or a box of 48 watercolour paints I think it can be a little bit daunting and sometimes they think they have to use everything in one painting and that's not the case you, you're best to work with a limited palette to begin with and then add to it as needs be and you know you don't need to use every colour in the box you know it's just building up gradually with your colors until you've got enough but not too many and that comes with practice just adding some highlighted tips of the hair there with the cream well yellow very light yellow coming back in with the derwent and it's a little bit dark but it's still showing up and that again gives it um, a little bit of diversity so we don't want every hair showing some of them wouldn't some of the hairs um, wouldn't be catching the light they'd be the light would be um, the other hairs would be shadowing them so you do want some darker hairs in there as well And there you can see a pencil where I've removed the wood with a knife and sanded the pastel itself on sandpaper. My preferred method. And as I said, there is a video on my channel just showing how I do that and how I then use the um, pigment that has been sanded off. I use that as a paint, mix it with water and use it as a paint so nothing is wasted, nothing needs to be wasted. <coughs> okay, starting on the base coats for this longer hair. Applying some earth tone shades and this will be for the shadowing underneath the lighter hair to give it a depth and dimension.
letting some of the um, pencil strokes now overlap the green to break up that solid line. A little bit of grey going in and that grey really is probably near enough the same colour as the paper so it's sort of merging with the colour of the paper and it's blending the other earth tone colours together too and putting some of the hair strokes in and the white and cream will overlap those too. So it's all about adding that uh, sense of depth and shadow. So these, this color, the colors that are going on now, these colors will create the shadow areas when the fur goes on top, when the detailed fur goes on top. Yellow, going in with the yellow again. And keeping the strokes random, heading in the right direction and no straight lines <clears throat> there's very few straight lines in nature um, hairs and in particular are not straight they generally have a curve or a kink and even some have a, like a little wiggle on them shape so trying to get that um, coming out in the fur blending those together for even more layers to go on top so as you can see it is uh, you know even though this is sped up 300 by 300 I think it's still so it's three times as fast as I was actually working it's still a lengthy process just building up the layers to get it to look how I want it to look and this working dark to light obviously getting the white in and it doesn't have to remain white it can be I can be tinting it and tint or tinting tinting is um, is just um, altering the hue of a light color by adding a translucent color a different translucent color over the top and there you go so using that technique that you've just seen there I worked down the chest area and now I can move over to this side so in all of my paintings um, I like to work back to front so working from something that's further away from the viewer and then gradually working to what's nearer to the viewer like doing the background first and then the subject so the same thing can be applied to this area of the cat. So I want to do these long creamy white hairs running down the neck area before I do the chin area and then I can do the cheeks. Yeah. So the chin is going to sit on top of the area I'm doing now and then the cheeks and uh, the top part of the muzzle is going to sit on top of the chin and lip area. So it's so they overlap, so they naturally overlap. <clears throat> That's how I want to uh, do it. So what do we do now? I'm hoping we go on to the lip and mouth and chin area. That's it. Okay. So again, resting my hand on the glassine and it won't smudge whatever's underneath it. It's fine. You could lean on a piece of paper, but the trouble is the paper that you're leaning on may have a tendency of smudging what's underneath it and then you'd have to go back and redo that area and you would be working backwards and forwards on your project then. Just um, establishing the dark area in there, One, uh, quite a bit of in, uh, contrast in the mouth area, lip area, chin area. <laughs> Blending it out. Those tools, the rolled up pieces of paper, blending tools don't sharpen them all I do um, I just use one end for darks one end for lights and use use the, I can use them for charcoal graphite uh, pastel but keep a separate set for each medium and all I do is if I've been using a really dark uh, blending out a really dark area I just simply wipe that tip off on my trousers <laughs> or on a tissue uh, or on an old t-shirt something like that and then I go in and I blend the next colour if you try and sharpen them they'll just fray and then they're pretty much useless so um, just keep separate sets for different mediums and wipe them 
on a dry cloth or tissue between uses and they'll last years. <coughs> Unless you're using them on something like a sanded paper, then that will just wear them away and they'll end up being feathered anyway. But I don't use sanded paper anymore. I used to a long time ago, but it's not um, acid free, so the longevity is questionable. So that's not used anymore. And the reason artists talk about, oh, like and subscribe. <laughs> My little pop-up just appeared, so yeah, please like and subscribe. And for those of you ha that have already liked and subscribed to my channel, I thank you so much. You make all of this worthwhile, because without you, there'd be no point in me doing this videoing. So thank you. Okay, um, why a lot of artists talk about um, <clears throat> the acidity of products is because the pH affects the longevity of products. That's why. So that's why we like to use acid free um, materials, um, acid free paper, acid free masking tape, acid free mount board when it comes to framing. So all that makes a difference because if you get an, any acidity in, say, paper or masking tape, it can yellow your paper over time and affect the properties, the longevity of your paints and your art materials. So just keep that in mind. If you're buying mount board and things like that, always make sure it's acid free. Any masking tape you use, it's always best to use acid free masking tape too, because masking tape leaves a residue on your paper. And if that has an acidity in it, that could leach into your painting or drawing over time, even after your masking tape has been removed. Excuse me, this is a long video to uh, do a voiceover for. <clears throat> so backwards and forwards again, lights and darks going in between the two, just building up this chin area. Long process, eh? <laughs> That's why, really, I'd, I mean, it would be easier doing voiceovers if the video was shorter. But I don't like to speed my videos up too much. I, I can give the impression that something was done really quick. And then the worst thing would for me would be for a beginner or somebody less experienced in a medium to sit down and think, oh, I saw Kerry in you know, one of her videos and she did this painting in, you know, the video is 20 minutes. Yeah, I know it was sped up a bit, but maybe she did it in an hour. And then to sit down and try a medium and then realise how long something actually takes. I don't want anybody to be put off a medium by speeding up a video to be so quick that it gives a false impression. Art takes time. Some artists are faster than others and by no means does that determine whether that one artist is better than an art, another artist. Some artists work quickly, others work slowly, other, other artists work somewhere in between the two. You know, it's um, art takes time. You know, you can do a five minute sketch while you're waiting for dinner to cook or even a one minute sketch in a sketchbook while you're waiting for a kettle to boil. But once you start working on actual projects, you know, you know, they do take time and just make sure you're putting a little bit of time to one side and your expectations aren't um, false, I guess. Um, drawing takes time, watercolours take time and oil painting takes time when you have to wait for layers to dry and things like that. I use liquid with my oil paints so the layers dry overnight but if you're using you know walnut oil and things like that it can be weeks drying time between layers and obviously with oil painting you've got to wait for one layer to dry before you can apply the next. Acrylics is a faster medium because they dry a lot quicker and obviously working with pencils or pastels, you've not got the drying time, but because you're covering 
especially with coloured pencils, covering a larger area with a small tip of a pencil, that takes time. So try and factor in that material, different materials and different size projects do take time and that time can um, differ, you know, between uh, subject matter and material differences. Wow, that was a lot of waffling just to say art takes time get over it <laughs> no in all fairness when you're starting out with a new medium um yeah it can be a bit of a learning curve realizing how long things take to do but don't be put off just start small and know that the bigger the project the probability is the longer it's going to take But everybody, if you know, if you're feeling creative, make some time for yourself. Even if it's just, you know, if the kids have gone bed and you've got half an hour or to yourself of an evening, just sit and sketch. Or even if you just get um, a colouring book, it's just relaxing, therapeutic, chill out time. For me, art is therapeutic. It's so. Uh, you know, it's what I've done since I was four and I'm 57 now. So years and years of painting and drawing and most of the time it comes naturally. You know, sometimes it just takes a little while longer, you know, when we're uh, trying to achieve something maybe we haven't achieved before. It takes a little bit longer, but it's still fun, not stressful. Just relax and enjoy the process and trust the techniques and it'll all come together in the end keep layering if it doesn't uh, look how you want it to look because it will get there in the end okay going on to the nose so <clears throat> a bit of a relief from the fur for a while just building up the layers though it's it's the same as doing the base layers on the furry areas it's just that we've got to remember that we're not putting any fur detail on top so we're keeping it quite smooth and with the painting being quite small, we know we've not got to go in with too much detail to achieve what we want in the end. So building up with some peachy colours. And this is pink. Just varying the colours slightly. And the nostril on the left hand side, um, I do enlarge slightly just to get it to match the angle that the eyes are at that's it when you're sketching out if you've got the head tilted especially the angle that the eyes are tilting the nostrils will tilt at the same angle so make sure you you get that correct it can be quite off-putting seeing students and they've done a brilliant you know head sketch portrait sketch and then the angles are slightly off because it does make the uh, subject look slightly deformed. And uh, sometimes you can disguise it, depends on what medium you're working in, and sometimes you can't. And this was my mistake by not correcting that in the initial sketch, but I do correct it as I move through the painting. So what I like to do is I like to do my initial sketch on just rough paper, sort of copy paper. If it's going to be a bigger project, I just tape a few sheets together, get that sketch drawn out. It may take a, you know, a little while, a bit of erasing and uh, backwards and forwards just to get the proportions right, composition correct, things like that. Once I'm happy with that, then I either, depending on what paper I'm transferring the drawing to, I use, either use a light box or some trace down paper and then trace down the lines that I feel are the ones that I want on my painting and not the ones that I don't need. And it just prevents any eraser marks and things like that ending up on your finished project paper or canvas. I know some artists use a projector to project um, images onto their canvas and sheets of paper, but I don't have a projector, so I don't do it via that method. Some artists use the grid method. I don't do that either. I just like to freehand sketch where possible um, and figure it out as I go along. 
I think the angle of the nose is being affected by the angle of the camera that I'm filming with as well because that looks more skew with than it actually did in life so uh, it all comes together in the end and it looks fine on the finished project so it might be uh, a case of the angle of the camera as well but as you can see in the finished painting it's uh, it is correct I did correct it but it looks more skew whiff now looking at it than it actually did so I, I blame that on the camera angle so not forgetting those little markings on the muzzle that I think all big cats have actually they you know the dots up the side of the muzzle getting some highlights in and the highlights um, they're not always on the top of the nose because um, there's obviously quite a lot of white uh, lighter fur underneath his nose some light will be cast up reflected off that whiter fur onto the underneath of the nose as well so it won't just be one big shadow under the uh, nose some lilacs brought in just to liven things up a bit around there well you're halfway through folks if you're still with me <laughs> we've got about <coughs> excuse me 40 minutes left you're doing well if you're still here thank you for uh, joining me on this epic adventure today to a near, near enough two hour video i hope you're enjoying it if you are painting and or drawing or you know working on a project of your own, I'd love to know what you're working on. So uh, drop it in the comments below, and uh, I do read everybody's comments. I do reply to everybody's comments. If you want to tag me on anything that you've created, and then and you're on Instagram, please tag me on it, and I'd love to see what you're currently working on or what you've worked on previously let's make a sense of community that's what everybody needs in 2023 i think so building up the darks now so keeping in mind that um, there are areas along the cheeks of animals where the whiskers come out and nine times out of ten they are denoted by the darker markings so keeping that in mind, I am trying to build up that look, but I don't just want to go in with um, a straight line of darker markings across that area. Got to keep remembering, keep reminding yourself that it's made up of different colour hairs. I'm sure the skin has a different pigment under there as well, but we can't see the skin, we can only see the hairs. So, but we don't want to make it look like he's got zebra stripes on his face because that wouldn't look right so not blocks of color but um just the hair the differing colors in hair so i've left that portion now obviously got fed up with doing that bit i did tell you that i flit about across a painting the more i get into a project the more i sort of flit about so just creating some texture and as I said the hair on this part of the lynx face is going to be very short so um, we want plenty of texture underneath the final detailing layer else it would look very flat and we don't want that it's too much of a pretty cat to uh, look flat I have some um, European lynx photographs from um, a safari park in Scotland I can't remember what it's called now so I will be using some of those photos for future projects um, <clears throat> and it's always nice I do prefer working from my own references but this photograph from Emmanuel just caught my eye and uh, I thought yeah that will do nicely for a workshop a wildlife art workshop so I run the, run the um, art workshops at WWT Martin Muir in Lancashire here in the UK 
and I alternate between watercolour workshops and pastel workshops. I'll, I'll link it in the description and then anybody wanting to go over and have a look at the dates. I've just waited, well yesterday's was the last one for this year and I'm just waiting now to um, verify dates for next year. And as soon as I know, they'll go out on my website. You can sign up to my website on my sign up to my newsletter. Sorry, on my website, and the dates will be published over there first. Building up the layers, and I'm literally tapping that. that pastel pencil because the markings are going to be so short in these areas I'm literally just tapping the pastel pencil this is when you need a good quality paper because um, the tooth of the paper is still um, I can still feel the tooth of the paper even though I've put on quite a few layers up to now as I'm applying the pastel pencil I can feel that the tooth of the paper is catching the pigment and that allows me to be able to tap markings onto the paper as opposed to having to draw them on, I guess, for want of a better word. Now going in with these darker markings. And quite roughly again, just just going on quite randomly and just getting that basic under coat done, the base coat done. Blending them in. We just want that underlying uh, random texture to be showing through the hairs just to give it that added depth. And that's like a yellow ochre well, that I use throughout the, the painting. It's not an overpowering colour, it's very subtle, but for wildlife artwork it really is a very nice colour. And the yellow by Creta Colour, Creta Colour. Just building up some fine hairs. I can go over with white. It's it won't be too light that the won't the white won't show. But I do need it to um, differentiate from the white because I do need some highlights in there where the light's going to be catching the fur even more. And as you can see, I did um, put a few little markings overlapping the lip area few little hairs, sorry, overlap in the lip area. Now pulling down a few finer marks around the nose. So this is some of the uh, final layers on this area going in now. Moving the pencil round and round in my hand, catching the uh, sharper edges on the paper so I don't have to keep sharpening it all the time. It's just just about layering, that's all it is. I'm so completely self-taught, I work in a multitude of mediums and every medium is self-taught so and it's just, it is a nice way. You definitely learn from your mistakes but um, but hopefully when people see my artwork no matter what medium it is they can tell it's mine because there's just something about being self-taught that enables you to come up with your own techniques and things. So a few darker hairs being quite prominent around that area of his face. So popping those in, now going in with the yellow again, the light yellow. And when you see it in person, it's not like, oh wow, that's a yellow pencil. It really is white with a hint of yellow. You know, it's lovely. Starting the... Um, whiskers now and with whiskers you do need a steady hand and I always hold my breath when I'm putting whiskers in sometimes you only get one go at a whisker so you've got to make it work I filmed the first go through on these whiskers and then I switched the video camera off and I got my head really 
up close and personal to this lynx and went over the whiskers a second time. But I couldn't have filmed that because um, my head would have been right in front of the camera. So go through once, get them in the position I want them in and then go through a second time and broaden them where they need to be broadened and highlight them where they need to be highlighted. And making sure when you go when you go with um, a lighter coloured pencil over a darker area, you do need to be wiping your pencil clean because as the pencil travels over the darker area, it will pick up the darker pigment. And if you don't clean it off, it will then deposit that darker pigment where you don't want it. So go through and put one line down, clean the pencil, go through, put your next line down, clean the pencil and so on. Okay, so back to the uh, Lynx's face and I'm literally just dotting and dabbing some texture in there with this burgundy pencil and Derwent again, the burgundy colour. And just creating more texture for the detail areas that are going to go on top. And really the direction of these markings isn't as, as important as the layers that go on top, the direction of the layers that go on top. You can use it sort of as a guideline for um, the layers that go on top. Now working down this area, I am working the markings now, these little ticks and dots and things in the right direction, just so I've got something to follow when I start applying the top layers. <coughs> Here we go. So we're using the yellow again, used this, this uh, light yellow a lot through, the, um, through this project. And I'm just putting little ticks, um, making sure they're going in the right direction. When you see me put my finger on the product like that, I'm not trying to blend it, I'm not trying to merge it, I'm just trying to flatten it slightly and that will enable it to glaze from the back with the... Um, layers that are underneath it so it just deadens the colour a little bit makes it less prominent it dulls it down I guess it just takes the brightness away when I pat it with my finger and obviously you don't want to do that in all areas because you want some areas to be brighter than others you can see how his little nose is finished there as well little cute nose I'm saying he I don't know if there was a he or a she I don't know Just all about direction now. I want to make sure those little ticks and taps of that pencil are going in the right direction. We want the hairs to um, always be going in the correct direction to the species that we're portraying. And the hair length, so the ticks and taps and dots and things that I'm creating with this pastel pencil need to be short longer in some areas, shorter in others, just to make the piece look more realistic. Going really, really short around this area now as you're coming towards the nose and then tapering off to the sides, heading down towards the cheek areas. That's the direction these need to go. Darker colour going in because it wouldn't all be caught by the light and you can go backwards and forwards dark to light, light to dark throughout this part of the painting just toning some of it down slightly and applying some darks which would act as like a shadow in area a little bit lighter colour adding a little bit of a different tone there a little bit of a different hue and just alternating between a handful of pencils at this point 
just add in interest with different colours, mixture of different colours and a ratio of different colours too. It all adds to the interest of a piece but still keeping quite a limited palette at this point. backwards and forwards and back in with the yellow creating areas where the lights hit in the um, fur more than in other places <coughs> final detailing going round the nose. If I go too light then I just glaze over it because I can always go backwards and forwards. I'm beginning adding some darker areas running down this side of the nose muzzle into the cheek area and where I want things to stay white that's where I put white to begin with such as the area underneath the eye on the left hand side his left on the right hand side his left eye so some guidelines for me going in there with the dark and this earth tone going in. I think this might be an umber, a colour umber. I'm not sure. I really don't keep note of the colours I use. I know the colours I want to use and I just pick them up and use them. But I don't really take much notice of the names on the colours. Unless it comes to a point where I need to order a new one. And then obviously I'll be looking to see what the colour name is. Or the colour number on the barrel of the pencil. Working with the yellow again, the light yellow by Criticolor. And then glazing over some of it with this uh, earth red colour. A little bit at a time. Notice how I'm just working on a small portion of the painting at a time. And then once I get that area near to completion, I can move on to the next portion of the painting. Okay, on to some base coat area now. And I've I'd, um, actually sanded that I went pencil down into a chisel shaped tip so I'd be applying more pigment um, in the same amount of time. So building up some colour again. Random. It's all going to be blended into the paper. We're pushed into the tooth of the paper. Creating shadow underneath that area for where the marking's going to go in. And where I use a colour in one area, generally pull it over and use it in another area too. Pushing it down into the tooth of the paper with the paper blender. Putting in these darks but making sure I don't get any darks on the lighter area that I've left um, to the left of where I'm working now. Left to the left. <laughs> and blending that in too. Just, well not blending so much as pushing it into the tooth of the paper so I can work over the top of it. Oh and I noticed something over there <laughs> that caught my eye. I did, did warn you, I flit, I do flit. Once the whole project was complete, um, 
I stepped away, went and got a coffee and then have a chill out time doing something else and then come back and I, and then I, I look and see what else needs altering and nine times out of ten there's always something that catches my eye that needs altering so but at some point you have to call a painting finished but uh, I did go back in and I think I did film it right yeah so, so I'm looking at the video which I did film it at the end I did make some alterations which you'll see in this very long video oh if you're still with me oh hats off to you so this is like one and a half hours in if you're still here well round of applause for you okay so I decided I needed a break from the face um and I'd run a piece of masking tape down and that's what I'm working against at the minute so I cropped my painting short because after second and third and fourth thoughts I decided I didn't like the composition that I decided on right at the very beginning and it was just simply a case of popping a piece of masking tape down to crop the area that I'd be working on so that I'd, I'd have a more of a square finish to this design which I feel now works much better than the um, longer version that I'd started off with in the beginning so you can alter things as you go yeah no such thing as can't okay so applying the pan pastels I wanted to get um, this area filled in now so I had a base coat to work on and it's a really quite a big area to be filling in with uh, pastel pencils so I decided to go along the pan pastel route to get the base the first base coat layers in now these colors don't automatically match the colors that I'd been using by Creta Color and Derwent so what you will see me do is go on to the face with some of these colors too to pull the two parts of the subject together you'll see that in a bit and that's the bit um, where I was saying know towards the end of the painting I decided to do that to, to, to pull the painting together and you think oh you go over all the detail on the face yeah look there you go picking up some of the colors that I'm currently working on the body and deciding I need some of those colors in the face there's so much tooth left on this paper that I can do this I would have been struggling I'd have been using a lesser variety of paper so using some of the colour now that I've been using on the body, placing it on the face and then it will just be a matter of just touching up the detailed areas that cover the top of that and it just pulls the whole painting together. I, was, I couldn't have left it as it was, I wouldn't have been happy with it and there's no point in having a painting um, that you'd be unhappy to sell. If there's something bothering you about, about a painting, don't start on something else until that painting's finished. Uh, you'll learn so much by um, just carrying on with a painting. I mean, if it's a hole in a canvas or you've torn a, a, the, the paper or something like that, fair enough. But if you're not happy with um, a painting, what's the worst that can happen? You completely ruin it and then you know but if it's something fixable if it's something that you think you know you could probably do it's just going to take a little while longer just do it because you're going to learn so much more than scrapping it and starting afresh I mean I wouldn't want to, to have started this again um, there's no fun in doing one um, the same painting more than once you know it just takes the joy out of it but I knew I wouldn't be happy if I didn't get the colour correction done at this stage of the painting so I did it and it just maybe added another two hours maybe onto or maybe even less than that onto the final painting so that's fine by me I'd come this far wasn't happy because the uh, the balance in the colour wasn't as I wanted it to be so I corrected it all worth it in the end So this, this way of applying base coat layers is, uh, as you can see, it's so much quicker than applying um, base coats with pencils. 
if I've, if I'd only got the pencils, I would have done it with pencils. It you know it can be done. It just takes a little bit longer. That's all. And when you're working as an artist for a living, you know time is money. So I wanted to get this done as efficiently as possible time wise. I'm building up the layers again and the same as when I'm working with the pastel pencils for the base coat layers I do want um, different colours going in and building up the layers not just with one colour but a few different colours now here you can see the area where I applied some more pigment the pan pastel pigment and this is how I went about getting texture back in with detailing so the pan pastel had covered up some of the texture and then I went on and corrected it with pencils And again, everywhere where I added some more pan pastel pigment, I go in and just correct the values a little bit. I mean, the values, um, what was dark and what was light, that's the values, weren't affected a lot. They were affected a little bit, but not a lot. It's just that I didn't want to, by adding that pigment, completely lose the detail that I'd put in. So it just meant going back in and just sharpening up some of the detail like that <laughs> wobbly wobbly cameraman that's me by the way <laughs> camera woman you allowed to say that camera operator there you go so i don't know what i'm doing at the minute i thought i'd edited out all the pauses but obviously not <clears throat> okay let's work on some of the um body area so i need to work on this body area and get it you know pretty much to completion before I work on the white fluff surrounding his face because that needs to overlap the area that I'm working on at the moment that's what I was mentioning earlier in the video where I work from um, things further away from the viewer to things that are nearer to the viewer so break, using the colour that I'm working on that darker area I'm breaking up the patch of fur as well so it's just not one hard line doing a bit of finger blend in there just to soften everything out going in just creating some guidelines for myself so I know which direction the fur is going to be going in this area going in with that light yellow but that will be um, softened down it won't look as harsh as it does going on there just building up some guidelines for myself so I know which way the fur is going to be going. I think I've just repeated myself, but you get the drift. Maneuvering my board now, um, so I'm more comfortable, in a, a better area to start adding this fur. And it's just the same as I did on the left hand side. I'd added a few different colours, blended them in together, so base coat colours. <coughs> excuse me, the uh, earth tones, beiges and things like that. Blended them out and now I can start applying the more detailed areas over the top. Lots of work done with this light, ye light yellow colour throughout the painting. It works really well. And if it comes out too yellowy in certain areas, <clears throat> I can glaze over it with other hues. And the best thing about this yellow is if it goes anything over anything that's black, it doesn't create green, which is good. <coughs> that's because the yellow pigment in it is very limited.
so putting tiny curves on each hair making sure the hairs are all heading in heading in the correct direction but no straight hairs at all now going in with the white that's actually a carbothello white i believe that i'm using there I've got the full set of uh, Carbothellos and I used to teach using the Carbothello pastel pencils. They're a wonderful um, starter pastel for people. They are light fast and they're sort of a medium range uh, softness. I've got a stumpy one that I'm using here in a uh, Derwent pencil grip just so you can use every single last bit of a pencil. I use these pencil extenders by Derwent. Going in with the light yellow again, just lifting a little bit more detail out of that area. But not covering, when I'm putting detail in like this, I still want the base coat layers to be showing through. There's no point in doing all of the work on the base coat layers, only to cover them up completely with lots of detail. So just make sure that um, I don't do that. Just tinting now, so, so just glazing over some of that light yellow. Not all of it, so it's quite random, just randomly spaced marks with the red. Just so I've not got just one big patch of um, <clears throat> light yellow detail. Getting that dark marking back in now. I don't think I'd have had gone over it at all at this point, so it's probably uh, one of probably a second or third um, coverage of pencil on that dark area near his eye. And yes, he is looking a bit skew with, but that is the angle of the camera still. I'm working in this area now and getting this marking in and I want this marking to end up being as dark as the markings on the left hand side of the portrait. No black, just going in, that's sort of a dark burgundy colour again. So if I need to use black I'll use it right at the end on the markings. That is black going into that side, but hope and I'm soft, oh, softening it with a bit of brown, and then hopefully won't have to go over that side again. <clears throat> Backwards and forwards, pottering about between all different areas now. Just creating that balance, making sure and keeping the balance throughout the piece. So if you put detail in one area, then really that detail has got to be somewhere else in the painting too. You can't just have a painting where the detail is just in one area. Unless you're creating a painting um, from a photograph that has very uh, shallow depth of field. So which you can do and it, it can be done, but where you'd probably get the lynx face where the eyes are in focus but everything else is out of focus it that can be done it's not a method that i tend to do though it's not a look that i i tend to go for okay back to the fur down the side of his face and under his chin building up the layers. The other layers have been pressed into the paper surface with the um, paper blending tool. And now you can see I can bring those hairs over the darker part, over the darker marking and it's fine because that dark pastel has been pushed right into the tooth of the paper. So when you're pushing it into the tooth of the paper it reveals the uh, the tooth above 
allowing you to apply even more pigment and that's what we're doing here so a few wispy hairs that are going over that dark area putting the final detailing onto this area now before I move on and then go through and create the body so it's about 10 minutes left of the video and I just uh, show you a couple of portions of the body that I'm working on before we call it the video complete adding a few highlights because remember we use the light yellow uh, for doing the detailing and now I'm just going on a, with white just to pick out a few portions here and there and this is where less is more if I'd have done all of the markings all of the detailing with white I couldn't have gone any lighter but because I used the light yellow I'm able to go on with the white and it show up He's got a cute face, hasn't he? <laughs> I really enjoyed doing this project. It was lovely. Okay, guidelines. So guidelines and textures now going on. So the pan pastel has been applied to all of the body area, been pushed into the um, tooth of the paper, blended well into the tooth of the paper. So now the uppermost tooth of the paper can catch the pastel pencil and now I'm applying and I'd go over the whole body like this and this is quite a quick process just very light guidelines so the reference images have been put away now I'm not using it anymore don't need it anymore and I just want to get on crack on and get the fur done on the body so alternating uh, the direction of the fur and keeping pretty much the same fur length but you've got to remember that the fur of the cat undulates throughout the contour of the body and this can affect the direction and length the look of the length of the fur there you can see it a little bit closer up there so I've gone in with the um, guidelines got them all in shorter fur towards the top of the painting and more out of focus the further away from the viewer I've popped the markings in with a darker pigmented pencil and now I'm applying the final details in this area working dark to light and in some areas light to dark <laughs> the joys of pastel you can do it both ways going on with that light yellow there again and then just glazing off a little bit with the red some out of focus markings up at the top back in with the yellow ochre the colours showing slightly different on my screen for this um, portion of the video but we're right at the end now we've got about seven minutes left that's all and you can see the actual colour in the finished painting top left hand corner so back in with the light yellow again if I go too light it's okay because I can glaze it back down picking out some dark areas between just to give it a sense of depth so the hairs would be creating shadows and where some of the hair is denser where the light wouldn't be able to penetrate through the fur I know there's going to be dark areas in there too I 
using that yellow ochre now because I don't want it all to be um, the light yellow detail it would be too much it would end up looking flat so I do need to alter the colours going from darks to lights back to darks again and that's sort of a tan colour so very earthy colour that one is breaking up the dark markings slightly obviously we don't want them looking like um, zebra stripes adding little bits of dark in here and there and it's just that breaking up I think it, if it was all one colour, if I did the detail in all one colour it would look monotonous it would um, it wouldn't look real, it wouldn't look natural. There's so many um, derivatives, I guess, of one colour and and you see them all in nature. It, oh, it's fascinating. I mean, I love detail. You know, you look at a dragonfly wing, um, for instance, and the veining throughout the wing, the reflections that um, are caught in it and all the different colours as the light refracts through um, the membranes and things like that, you know, colour is everywhere in nature you've only just got to stop and look and it's just phenomenal and just ca trying to capture a tiny little bit of that um, in your artwork is oh, it's just a wonderful feeling it really is and you just need that diversity in a painting still using a limited palette you can still create such a lot with a limited palette even if it is pastels or you know coloured pencils just um is amazing I love it it just fascinates me every painting fascinates me so yeah just using um, the same colors but in different layering situations and different intensities it just adds depth and interest to each part of the painting and that's what I'm trying to create here so although the body of the cat isn't the main point of interest within the painting I still don't want it to be redundant that's why I cropped the painting where I did because the other part of the body would have been sort of a redundant factor within the painting so that's why I did that but I don't want this part to be redundant I want this part to be of interest too obviously it's not going to be the main part people initially look at that's going to be the face but hopefully their eyes will wander and um, find interest in this area too well folks we've got about three minutes left <laughs> thank you so much if you've uh, stayed throughout this process it's been a long one but uh, hopefully you've enjoyed it hopefully you've been inspired to create some artwork for yourself or try new techniques or new mediums even um, if you have let me know in the comments below I'd love to hear from you um, yeah so finishing touches to this little guy lots and lots of layering I hope you're all keeping well uh, yeah thanks so much if you've sat through this longer than normal video if you'd like to see more long videos like this one then let me know if you'd like to see short videos or a mixture of both let me know and uh, I will take note and provide what my viewers want and what they require for their own art time maybe you do like to sit back and paint while you're listening to longer videos just let me know and I'll provide those for you if you'd like me to review any materials then let me know and I'll see what I can do if it's something you're putting off buying because you're not sure whether your it's going to be a fit for your studio or your you know your artworks just give me the nod and I'll see what I can do because nine times out of ten with being a youtuber I can get hold of art materials and I may already have them so uh, just let me know because I don't review and work with and video everything that I have um, been doing this for a long long time so I do have quite a lot of art materials 
that have built up during the years and some have recorded and some I haven't so I might have just what you want to know about if you let me know I'll have a look final countdown folks okay thank you for watching um, stay safe uh, stay creative and I'll see you all really soon take care and bye for now bye